You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Hello and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Ori Winokur. Ori Winokur is one of the most prominent characters in the Israeli music scene today, producing and engineering many popular records from his studio in Tel Aviv, The Slick, and also playing bass for many popular artists throughout the world. Born in Jerusalem, after studying music in high school and at the New School University of Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York, Ori started working as a house engineer for live events, starting his audio engineering journey. In 2003, Ori and five other Jerusalemite musicians established the funk, hip-hop, jazz supergroup Kulalush. The band soon grew a tremendous reputation and massive amounts of fans in Israel and abroad. Ori's first real production break came with Asaf Avidan and the Mojos. In the summer of 2006, Asaf Avidan and the Mojos and Ori convened to record The Reckoning. Working with a tight budget, the whole album was recorded and mixed in 15 days. Nevertheless, the album received massive media praise and reached gold status in Israel less than a year after its release, being the first Israeli artist that performs in English to sell gold. Before long, the Mojos started to gain international attention and Ori's career of producing was in full swing. Today, Ori is busy producing music for many different artists and touring throughout the globe. He's worked with artists such as Lola Marsh, Sivan Talmor, System Ali, Yossi Fine, Hayel Ala, and many more. Ori has also worked with numerous jazz artists, including Third World Love, Omer Avital, Avishai Cohen, the trumpet player, and many more. Ori first came to my attention years ago when I was looking to build out the acoustics of my own studio, and I was shown his studio by Omer Carney, who may, had d- actually done an amazing job for both of us. In addition, he recently produced my good friend's debut EP, Rodan's. It's called Sometimes You Love. So it's an honor to bring Ori to the show. Welcome to the show, Ori. Thank you, Ben. Happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. So tell us a bit about how you got started getting involved in music production. Well, first of all, I guess I've been into music uh, ever since I can remember myself. I always liked listening to records, even as a very young baby, as my parents tell me anyway. I was a big Beatles fan as a kid. Basically, I started out playing saxophone. You'll be surprised because I kind of dropped it after a few years. But that was my first instrument. I think I started at the age of uh, 12 or something like that. And I played the sax for a few years studying jazz. Uh, but then I quit and I, I bought a, an electric guitar. And for my bar mitzvah at the age of 13, I asked my uh, aunt from London to buy me a four track because I guess I was always really like, really interested in how records are made because I kept listening to the records, you know, and I watched the covers and looked at the labels. And it always really interests me to know what's, how does this magic happen? How do people create this? So it really was always something that really, really interest, interested me. And then I got a four track and then I bought a bass guitar so I could play bass on my songs that I recorded on my four track. So I would have like a track for guitar, a track for bass and then for whatever vocal and some sounds. So I guess that was the first thing I was doing as a very young kid already. And then on, on uh, when I was at high school, I played in a few different bands. I was like really busy as a bass player in Jerusalem. And when I finished high school, I went to New York to study at the New School University. I did not stay there for too long. I mean, I was there for like one semester. And when I came back to Israel, I started working at the Yellow Submarine in Jerusalem, which is a music center that has a studio and a live show venue. And I basically, I think that's where I really started because I worked there a lot for six years, almost every day. And I guess that's where I really started working in the music industry, more or less, here in Israel, because I met a lot of people and I learned a lot about studio work. I used to come to every studio session they had, even if I wasn't on the job. And also, I think I got connected to many, many musicians that actually, till this day, are my main guys here in the local scene. And I guess that's also where I first met Asaf Avidan, which I was uh, lucky to later produce his first record with the Mojos, which was a very big success both in Israel and abroad. And I think for me, it was this, I mean, I was playing music for many years and I was doing engineering for many years. And I think there was this moment for me that I understood that I can combine both and be a producer in a way. 
And the studio was always my biggest love, I guess, like really, since I was a kid, as I told you. I mean, for me, it was always the biggest magic is how records are made. And I kept reading about it and watching every yeah. classic album on, on VH1 series and, you know, like any kind of info. It was before Google. So, you know, we had to kind of look for information back then. But it always was really my thing. And uh, I guess my first break was doing a soft record. And I mean, I was very lucky that it was also one of my most successful records I've ever made. to this day and it kind of opened the gate for me to be a producer and I got a I think to this day it's like now over 10 years since we made that record and I still get people calling me because of that album so it's kind oh, of wow. amazing that's amazing was there a song or album that really opened your mind to the possibilities of what could be accomplished with production uh, Wow so many <laughs> I don't know where to start but I guess as a kid it was the Beatles for sure and I think it was I am the walrus that came I was, you know, always listening to it and was like, how the fuck did this happen, you know? So, <laughs> but there are really many of those along the way, so I'm not even sure what to say. I mean, so, and I also really like so many different styles of music that in almost every kind of genre I can point out something that was mind-opening for me, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. So today you're working with all kinds of artists. What, what do you look for in an artist when you're trying to see if it's going to be a good fit working together? Well, that's a very good question. And actually, it's a very important one as well, because I really believe that producing an artist is like it's a relationship that's almost as intense as marriage, you know, at least for the time <laughs> that you're making the record. And it has to do... I mean, in order for it to work well, it ha you have to have a great one-to-one -one connection on the personal level. First of all, I mean, it has to be somebody you can spend time with and, and enjoy it because you're going to be spending a lot of time together, right? And the yeah. second one, of course, it's kind of a musical connection. And I think for me, the things that I used to really check when I start working with someone is, first of all, of course, I want to listen to all the songs they have. Also, because many times the artist himself is not really aware of what's his best work, you know? so it's really important for me to and also to know his entire scope of writing and it also kind of gives me a gateway into his uh, artistic soul you know to understand everything that he writes uh, he or she of course and then I kind of I mean my best way of doing it is I normally start very slowly meaning we would meet a few times and We would first of all of course get acquainted and listen to the songs that they wrote and and during those listen listening sessions we would talk about music and I would try to see if my ideas or my directions really fit in a way if I can feel that I'm uh, fertilizing the artist's mind with new ideas which are in the right direction and if we see that starting to happen then normally we would get on and start really working together and I guess I also uh, it's very important for me to see that the person is open-minded because today a lot of artists come with a very closed idea of what they think they want yeah and yeah. normally if you come to a producer if you really want to To enjoy what he can bring to your music, you need to be open at least in some ways, and on the other hand, I would check to see that they're not all the way open that they have a statement that they're coming with, you know because otherwise mm. this is something a producer can't invent for anybody, so it's like a really thin line, I guess, and if I want to summarize it to one sentence, I'm looking for the center of the artist, and then I, I'm trying to see if he's connected to it well enough. And if I can connect to that and really help it grow, you know? Wow, I love what you said there. That's amazing. I've also, I found myself personally, like, the artists that are too closed in on their vision, it's, it's going to be a nightmare to work with them because they're going to micromanage you to death, basically. Absolutely. And then every small little thing is, can become a very big deal. And you're not sure about this guitar part, so you think it's the end of the world and the production. And, you know, it can get yeah. too much. Yeah. And on the, but again, I can say that as well. And on the other hand, when somebody has no vision of his own as an artist, first of all, in a way, it means they're not ready to record an album yet. Definitely not an <laughs> album. Maybe one song to, to learn a little bit and so on. And also, I mean, you can do a great job as a producer there because you have like, normally you would have like free, you can do whatever you want to do. But then normally the artist won't be very satisfied with it no matter what you do. So it's really like a thin line of finding that sweet spot where you feel that, first of all, you contribute to the artist's work, but still give a lot of yourself and feel connected to it. And I guess those are things that I, get, I think 
in most cases you feel really like up front it would take me two or three meetings to be sure about it you know either way I think more or less that's great advice thank you uh, so what do you listen for the first time you hear a song and that said do you do you want to hear like a demo or do you want to hear something that's like raw and live what are you looking for great question for me I really like I f- I'll say something before I think the first time you hear a song or listen to a song is a very special time because it's the only one that it's gonna be a first time and once for me anyway once I hear something or listen to something I kind of have it in my mind already and I'm I might be biased about it later you know so for me I always I really cherish that first listen first of all and my ideal for me the ideal is to sit with the person and let him play it the way you wrote it if it's on guitar or piano or whatever it is and just hear it it's not a, just a raw sketch it's like the real thing for me I want to be there and That's like the ideal yeah. situation. The second option would be listening to a raw sketch, like a recorded session of the same. And then if they had made any sketches previous to our meeting, I would like to listen to that later on, sometimes even much later on. Because I think when you hear an arrangement, an arrangement, it's like, it's like a costume, you know, when you see somebody in, in one set of costume, You think that's what it looks like, you know, so yeah, and then it's really hard to imagine anything else, so for me, and also, I mean, this kind of connects to the previous question as well i really I am a very big believer in in songs, in the raw material of songs, meaning a good song is supposed to work without any costumes, so when you do a first listen, which is only this raw sketch playing. Then you really know what are the best songs, and you know you can really map it out and understand what's on the basic material level, what's the best that you have, what works, what doesn't work, uh, what points out more than others, and so on. you know and I actually yeah. I have this tradition that uh, when when I do those listening sessions, those first listening sessions, I say nothing and I just write comments for each song. And then I always check those comments when we finish the record, and they're always so relevant, and you could see how that first listen was so relevant to what's really important at the end as well. So it kind of proved to me that it's a, it's a very important session, that first one. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Of course, I'm here to share what I can. So uh, generally speaking, how, how do you get the ball rolling when it, when it comes to starting the actual production? Do you have a go-to instrument or sound bank? Uh, what's going through your mind? Well, that, that's a hard question to answer because it really, really changes between an artist to an artist. And also, honestly, sometimes I prefer not making it so official because, you know, that mentality of now I know I'm being recorded normally destroys everything. So sometimes I'm trying to make it like a really fluent procedure from those first listening sessions. Though I would go, hey, let's go record that song for a second and see what happens if you just do it like that. just so we sketch it I, I kind of I mean this is maybe something I shouldn't say to the public but it's like a little trick that people when artists are free they they perform better you know and I, yeah. I actually have some songs on records which are that first take that the artist never thought was going to be the actual take of the song you know but then I mean to answer your question more on the production or, or arrangement there is no real answer to this because I would always change and honestly I mean I For me, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of producer, I mean, I don't have like a signature sound. I, I work with the artist that I'm in front of, and I did so many styles and different production methods to this day that there is no one real way to do it. And I think in general, when it comes to singer-songwriters, I'm a big believer of vocals first, in a way, at least. Meaning I would try to mm-hmm. get a great vocal take to begin with, like with the most simple backing track, It could be a guitar that we can mute later, or it could be a simple harmony pad, so something that's not too disturbing. But then again, I guess we haven't really discussed this, but there is something that I do on a pre-production level mo- normally, which is very important, is kind of making the songs ready to record before we ever press record. Meaning if we want to check scales, or if we want to check tempos or forms, and how is this song supposed to feel, and kind of try to imagine where is the arrangement going to go to before we start. At least for me, sometimes it's not even discussed, but I have this idea, 
And then I'm trying to start with this most important track. And normally it would be the vocals when it comes to singer-songwriters. But again, every record is different because you might decide you want to record with a live band and then it's all different. Or, but if it's one-on-one, I would normally do that, at least for the past few years. That was my uh, So before method. you even open the DAW, you know, open Pro Tools or whatever, you're, you have the tempo charted, you have the key charted, you have... You have the arrangement charted. Yeah, normally we start at the, in the living room, as I say. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the computer is not running or rolling. And um, yeah, and honestly, I mean, I had artists that we met once a week for a year before we actually started to record. 